What's up everybody, GenX Dividend Investor here. In this insightful video, I go over the dividend fallacy theory, which helps explain why dividends are not free money. And if that sounds intriguing, then please do me a favor and hit the thumbs up button, subscribe if you haven't yet, and click that bell icon so you're notified when I post new videos. Okay, so if you know me, then you know I love dividends, but I also like to hear opinions of people who aren't dividend zealots like I am. Thus, that leads me to a paper called The Dividend Disconnect, written a few years ago by a couple of finance professors from prestigious business schools, which in essence found that many investors aren't looking at dividends the right way, and thus maybe making poor portfolio decisions. The authors found that some investors trade stocks without fully appreciating that dividends come at the expense of stock price decreases, a mistake they call the free dividends fallacy, because in reality investors shouldn't care whether they get dividends or share appreciation. Or to say that differently, Investors wrongly view dividends as additional income, rather than a shift of money from the stock price to the dividend. In fact, they also found that many institutions trade as if dividends and capital gains are disconnected attributes, and that professional analysts often fail to account for the effect of dividends on price, leading to optimistic price forecasts for dividend-paying stocks. So let me show you what that means with an example. I'll log into my Premium Seeking Alpha account and look at Caterpillar, an industrial stock I'm long in. We see that today, on May 2nd, 2023, CAT is at $213.31 a share. Then I'll click on the Dividends tab to see a bunch of other valuable information. On the right-hand side of the screen, we see that Seeking Alpha writers have CAT as a buy, whereas Wall Street has it as a hold, and Seeking Alpha Quant has it as a strong buy. Seeking Alpha's Quant ratings are an objective, unemotional evaluation of each stock based on data, such as the company's financial statements, the stock's price performance, and analyst estimates of the company's future revenue and earnings. Over 100 metrics for each stock are compared to the same metrics for other stocks in its sector. The stock is then assigned a rating of strong sell, sell, hold, buy, or strong buy, along with a score from 1 to 5, where 1 is strong sell and 5 is strong buy. That entire right column has information you won't see on free Seeking Alpha accounts, only on premium ones. Anyways, in the middle section we see that Caterpillar pays its dividends quarterly, and they pay out $1.20 each time. So what that means is that on the X date, the stock falls by $1.20. Thus, if it was at $213 a share, then it would fall to $211.80 on the X date. Because like I said, the price of a stock falls by the amount of the dividend on its X date, and that's part of the reason why those authors said that dividends are not free money. Now I also read an article that said that because people know that prices will fall on the X date, more buying often happens, which then props up the price of quality dividend stocks, usually back to where they were before, aka that kind of counters things a bit. And on top of that, another phenomenon I've read about is that the lower a good dividend stock goes, and the higher the yield goes in response, that also acts as a beacon to investors to buy the dip, as they want to lock in a higher yield. And while the whole concept of buy the dip also applies to non-dividend stocks, it's even more powerful on dividend stocks because of yield hunters who want to lock in that yield. Though logically the authors would say they shouldn't have a preference for yield. I.e. a $1 dividend from a share of stock should be no more meaningful than selling $1 worth of shares, given the share price on average drops by the amount of the dividend when it's paid. All that being said, the dividend fallacy authors are missing a huge value of dividends that you don't get with non-dividend stocks. A key point they ignore is that my dividend checks tend to keep flowing in, even if I don't have the mental capacity to sell my stocks, and even if I'm gone. And that's very powerful for someone like me who wants to be able to provide for my family even if I'm not here. And my wife also wouldn't realistically be adept at selling shares. My wife doesn't know a taxable account from a traditional IRA. She doesn't know what the tax implications are of selling a stock, etc, etc. She's a wonderful person, but is absolutely atrocious with numbers and has zero clue about the stock market. Thus, the authors are discounting the reality that everyone isn't comfortable to simply sell shares. The value we get from the automation of dividend cash flowing into my portfolio and then directly into our checking account without any interaction is massive. Literally, I could die tomorrow and the cash would keep flowing into our bank. And I'm not the only one that really values that passive aspect of dividend stocks. As I've mentioned in the past, I once overheard an elderly lady at my CPA's office who was very grateful that her husband had invested in dividend stocks when he was alive, because now those dividends were providing most of her retirement income years later, even though she was clueless to how it all worked. Anyways, another conclusion that the dividend fallacy authors found was that investors, including mutual funds and institutions, are less likely to sell stocks that pay more dividends. The authors say that logically that shouldn't be the case, but it is. So that begs the question. If you know that humans tend to operate a certain way, even if it's financially illogical, 
like in this case a resistance to selling dividend stocks, do you then ignore that reality or do you factor it into what you do? I guess each of you need to decide that answer for yourself. And beyond the value props I've identified for dividend stocks, I also know that multiple studies have shown that dividend stocks have tended to outperform non-dividend stocks over long periods of time in countries around the world. So to me that is another reason to favor quality dividend stocks over non-dividend stocks, which the authors also fail to mention. Moving along, the authors did find that investors focusing on the dividends, presumably for the perceived attractiveness of the income stream, are likely to pay less attention to the capital gains component of returns. Or to say that differently, some dividend investors don't pay as much attention to stock price appreciation as they should. And here I agree with them, as I think it's a mistake to forego looking at total returns as part of your analysis. But it's quite common to find dividend investors who seem to over-index on current yield over anything else. Like they'll go 100% into some big high-yielding stock without understanding the risks of doing so, or the trade-offs of doing so, or the probable long-term total returns implications of doing so. At the same time, I can find investors who argue that the only thing that matters is total returns, and I think they're mistaken as well, as a lot more goes into your investing decisions beyond total returns. Like I might purposely invest in a sector that I acknowledge might not have the best total returns, but I do so for sector coverage's sake. Anyways, the dividend fallacy authors also found that dividend demand is higher when interest rates are low and bond interest payments provide less income. Well, to me that finding makes intuitive sense, but the authors would argue not financial sense. Intuitive because if interest rates are low, like let's say at 1 or 2%, then people think, okay, if I can get 3 or 4% from dividends, then that makes them better, right? And conversely, if interest rates are high, at like 5%, and you can make that return in a savings account, then why invest in a 3% yielding dividend stock at all? Well, now that you understand that total return, aka stock price appreciation plus dividends, is what generally really matters, then interest rates being low is probably less important than determining what total return you believe you can make with your stocks. And the same is true when interest rates are at 5%. Instead, you should be asking yourself if an almost risk-free 5% is better than a 7% stock appreciation and a 3% dividend return, or whatever the percentages are. That being said, you also need to think about tax implications of selling stocks and moving into a savings account, along with any other implications you may face. Like my unique health realities influence what I do, thus I'd pretty much never sell all my stocks and put that cash into a savings account, even if savings account rates were at 10%. And then along with the interest rates finding, the authors also concluded that demand is higher for stocks whose dividends are more stable, and whose dividends have increased in the recent past. So the authors would probably say that rather than focus on dividends increasing, instead focus on if total returns have been increasing. They also found that demand for dividends is lower when recent past market returns have been higher. In these times, the smaller predictable stream of payments from dividends appears less attractive compared with the large recent capital gains. And again that makes intuitive sense that in a bull market, many people shy away from conservative blue chip dividend stocks in favor of whatever is moving up fast. Though the authors would say that regardless of what market you're in, you should always be looking at total returns. They also estimated that investors buying dividend paying stocks during times of high demand earn roughly 2% to 4% less per year. Thus an investor whose preferences for dividends cause them to shift into and out of dividend paying stocks at the same time as other investors would lose a significant portion of the equity premium by doing so. Or to say that differently, if you FOMO into dividend stocks after markets have crashed, maybe like those who fled into dividend stocks after things crashed in 2022, then you risk underperforming. The people who did well in 2022 are those that had dividend stocks before things crashed, as they tended to hold up more. And so the people who then jumped in after things fell not only missed the less downside, but then as things bounced back, they also missed some of the bounce up, as conservative dividend stocks often don't react to the upside like small cap stuff. Okay, and another finding the dividend fallacy authors had was that some dividend lovers look at dividends like bonds, aka that they're pretty much guaranteed to produce small, stable gains over time. But of course, nothing is guaranteed, and I'd argue not even bonds. I mean, we've seen how even dividend aristocrats can stop paying dividends to their point. Another key point along the dividends are not free money vein is that the dividend payout comes at the expense of using that cash somewhere else. Thus, there is a potential opportunity cost by paying a dividend. However, I'd argue it's prudent to return cash to shareholders when management feels that they have the cash they need to grow as they feel makes sense. Another conclusion the authors had was that investors tend to hang on to dividend paying stocks for longer periods of time regardless of performance. Like your dividend stock might have crappy total returns, but you hang tight, which isn't financially prudent. Of course you might still be holding on to something for other reasons, but the key point is to always be aware of how your biases might be impacting your returns. 
Another key problem they found was that some investors don't count dividends when they're looking at the gains or losses that were made when buying a stock. AKA they focus on whether a stock has gained or lost money relative to the purchase price, but didn't also factor in dividends received. My recommendation is to be aware of your unrealized gains from stock appreciation along with your realized returns of your dividends to fully understand how your portfolio is doing. Now all that being said, there are also famous finance professors who are big dividend advocates. And that's not to say those previous people aren't dividend advocates, it's just that they think people need to be aware of what they're doing. Like listen to Dr. Jeremy Siegel, a PhD from MIT who is arguably one of the most recognizable and renowned finance professors in the world and is someone who teaches at one of the best graduate business schools in the world at Wharton. I do think that the, the only inflation protected yield, because there's going to be much more inflation, is really the dividend paying stocks. So, you know, if you're if you want that income, I still think that people are going to look around and say, that those dividend paying stocks are where, where I'm going to go. Yeah. So I think a takeaway from all this is just to invest with your eyes open, with self-reflecting on your biases. But it's great to invest in quality dividend stocks. Like here's a paper I just found on Fidelity called Income Investing for Retirement, The High Road of Growing Cash Flow Returns with Dividend Stocks. It calls out the value proposition of dividend investing in that they have higher returns historically compared to the market and that multiple studies have shown more positive performance with dividends. It mentions how bond payments are fixed, but dividends may increase, and that dividend stocks have reduced risk, lower volatility, return of cash, and may grow cash flow over time, along with might realize a 5% plus annual raise, aka dividend hikes. And then the Fidelity article talks about the empirical evidence of dividend stocks, and it quotes Dr. Siegel where he found that 97% of total real accumulation from stocks comes from reinvesting dividends. And speaking of reinvesting dividends, an intriguing finding the dividend fallacy authors had was that investors rarely reinvest dividends into the companies that paid them. Instead, most people tend to use the payouts to purchase other stocks. The researchers documented that market-wide dividend payments manifest themselves in the markets by driving up the prices of non-dividend paying stocks on average on days with high dividend payments. Fascinating. Back to Fidelity, they also cited Daniel Paris, who wrote the book called the strategic dividend investor who found that 85 to 90 percent of S&P 500 returns from 1926 to 2010 were from dividends. Fidelity also mentioned the reduced risk of dividend stocks and they quote a Goldman Sachs paper called Why Dividend Growth Matters that shows how the annual return of dividend stocks was 8.8 percent as compared to the S&P 500 at 7.1 percent. Another thing I like about dividends is that it gives you a conservative stream of value today from your investments, rather than waiting for potentially decades down the road to sell. And while you could adopt a similar strategy of selling a small amount of your non-dividend shares every quarter to get some cash, it just doesn't feel the same, which is a bias. I mean, in the dividend case, your share quantity isn't decreasing, though the counter to that is that the bottom line financial outcome is the same. Anyways, the reality is that each investing strategy and asset out there has bulls and bears, whether we're talking gold, crypto, dividend stocks, whatever. Regardless of what you do, make sure to invest in great companies. Listen to this other clip from Dr. Siegel to help hammer in that point about investing in quality stocks. And I would say the following, um, that stocks are the most volatile asset class in the short run but the most stable asset class in the long run. Mm -hmm. And if you take a look at the graphs that are in that book, you see that, a lot of wiggles in that line, but a steady upward movement that surpasses all the other asset class, gold, bonds, bills, and everything else that I trace for over two centuries of the data. It's the essence, if you will, of, of compounded returns. Absolutely. Right? It's the power and, and, of compounded well, my, returns. My compound long run return for 220 years after inflation, and that's really key here, 6.9% per year after inflation, capital gains plus dividends after inflation. I mean, that is a number, as you mentioned, the power of compound interest that doubles almost every 10 years uh, after inflation. And that is really an astounding return. Nice. And now I hope you have a better understanding of why dividends are not free money, but why I still feel they are the best way to create long-term sustained wealth. Of course, don't invest in a company only because it has a dividend. I mean, there are other things you need to look for, like a long history of increasing dividend payments, a trend of increasing cash flow over time, a payout ratio that shows the dividend payment is easily covered. You also want to see that the company's debt is manageable, 
and learn to understand when debt makes sense and can help a business grow. And you want your companies to have good credit ratings and other things like that. I'm sure if you keep learning, you'll definitely figure things out. And now I'd like to close things out with a shout out to Andrew S., who just snagged a Patreon King slot, though for now I'm completely sold out on Aristocrat and King seats. Though if you refresh my Patreon page every so often, I'm sure you can grab a seat. Kings get access to my dividend spreadsheet product that I use in my videos, and they get to be in multiple private channels on my dividend discord chat server, where I let my upper tier patreons watch my videos before I release them publicly on YouTube, as well as let them vote on which thumbnails I use for my videos, and of course they get more direct access to me. I also do a shout out as you just heard, and I add them to my scrolling news ticker, if I still have space on it. Kings also get a private 30 minute monthly voice chat on my discord to talk about whatever they want. Finally, don't forget to check out my Seeking Alpha referral link in the description of this video, as they currently have a sale running where new people can sign up for the premium membership for only $99 for the first year, along with a 7 day free trial that you can cancel if you don't like it, versus the normal $239 a year that I personally paid for years. I literally won't buy or sell a stock anymore without first checking out that stock's articles and comments section on Seeking Alpha. Note they mentioned they would probably be changing the promotional offer at some point, potentially soon, so I recommend signing up using my link. I want to pitch something unless I really value it. And as always, if you made it this far in the video, then please hit the thumbs up button, subscribe if you haven't yet, and click that bell notification. Plus, I urge everyone to join my free Dividend Discord chat server, which has over 10,000 investors on it from 72 countries around the world. Thanks for watching, stay positive, and I'll talk to you again real soon. I am not a financial advisor, and these videos are for entertainment, inspiration, and educational purposes only. Investing of any kind involves risk. I am only sharing my opinion with no guarantee of gains or losses on investments.